Yeah, my question is, how can I prove Yahweh is not Allah? All right. How do we prove that Allah of the Quran is not Yahweh of the Holy Scriptures? You have to open up your Quran. El Quran, El Karim, chapter 5, verse 18. Um, the Jews and the Christians each say, we are the children of Allah and his most beloved. Say, open. So what do the Jews and Christians say? Um, we are the children of Allah and his most beloved. So what does Allah say in response? Why then does he punish you for your sins? No, you are only humans like others of his own making. He forgives whoever he wills and punishes whoever he wills. To Allah alone belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth and everything in between. And to him is the final return. It's saying the Jews and Christians saying we are the sons of Allah. Now, no Jew, no Christian at that time believed Allah was a physical being who had sex, right? Yeah. So when they said we are the sons of Allah, they meant spiritually, right? He's a spiritual father. We are spiritual children. Yes. And he gives, he begets children spiritually, not sexually, by his word when we trust in it, correct? Yeah. And Muhammad said, no, Allah is not your father, even in a spiritual sense. You are just creatures that he created, right? Yeah. So Muhammad does not accept that Allah can be a father, even spiritually, right? Yes. So what's the highest relationship you can have with Allah? Go to chapter 19 of the Quran, 88 to 93. They say, most gracious has begotten a son. I'm using, reading you Safawi. Okay. Indeed, you have put forth a thing most monstrous. That is something shocking and disgusting for you to say. Add it, the skies are ready to burst. The earth is to split us on even creation is disgusted with you saying Allah has a son. And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin that they should invoke us on for most gracious. For it is not befitting, consonant with the majesty of the most gracious or compassionate that he should beget a son, not one of the beings in the heavens and the earth, but must come to the most gracious as a servant, as a slave. Mm -hmm. So what size relationship you can have with Allah? A slave. You have to be a That's slave. you are, right? Yeah. So now go to chapter 9, verse 30. The Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, while the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. Such are they baseless assertions, only parroting the words of earlier disbelievers. May Allah condemn them. How can they be deluded from the truth? Did you catch it? Allah will condemn you and fight you because you are a pervert, like the disbelievers of all of old for saying Messiah is the son of Allah. Yeah. You see? So the Messiah is not the son of Muhammad's God. Muhammad's God is not a father to anyone spiritually. And all you can be is a slave to Allah, correct? Yeah. Now yes. let's see who Allah is according to the Bible. Go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 to 23. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, such, as, such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So if you say God is not the Father, Jesus Christ our Lord is not a son, who are you? Antichrist. Muhammad said Allah is not the Father, Jesus is not a son. Who is Muhammad? Antichrist. So what spirit inspired Muhammad? Antichrist. You got it. Not only that, but if you deny that Jesus is the Son of God in whom there is life, and you must believe in him as God's son to have life, you make God a liar, because God bore witness this is my son. In the same epistle, 1 John, don't change. Go to chapter 5, read 9 to 13. Because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar. You make God a liar, huh? If you don't believe the testimony that God gave. And what is the testimony that God gave? Keep reading. Because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. Well, and this is a testimony God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son whoever has the son has life whoever does not have the son of God does not have life I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life so you're, the eternal life comes from believing and trusting and loving Jesus Christ the Lord as the Son of God. And God is born witness. You want to live? You must believe in my Son. Yes. But Muhammad said, Allah is not the Father. Jesus is not a Son. So Muhammad just said, God lied when he said, He is my Son. And life is found in Him when you trust in Him for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Mm -hmm. So how can Muhammad be a prophet and Allah be the true God when Muhammad is a liar and antichrist and he denies what the true God has said about our Lord Jesus Christ, correct? Yes, correct. So now go to Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Okay. See what God himself said on the Mount of Transfiguration. Our Lord went on a high mountain with three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. And he was transfigured. He became gloriously white. And Moses and Elijah came and appeared and bore witness to him. And then they saw a cloud, a visible cloud come down, and they heard a voice audibly. And what did that voice say? Mark 9, 7. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Wait. God says, This is my son of my love. You listen to him. And he even appeared visibly in a cloud and made his voice be heard audibly so that Peter, James, and John could see he is so glorious that I myself will appear visibly and allow you to hear my voice audibly to know who he is and why you need to trust in him. Oh. Right? Yeah. Okay, now what does Jesus say if all you are is a slave? If you're a slave and not a son, what hope is there for you? Go to John 8, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 34, 36. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who, sin is a, who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So Jesus said, if all you are is a slave, you have no permanent place in God's house. That's why the son of God must set you free and make you a child of God. So you can have a permanent place. Yeah. Did you catch it? Yes, yes. But Allah says all you are is a slave. Why do you think Muslims fear death and judgment? Because being slaves, they have no assurance whether Allah will forgive them. Yeah. But Jesus says, once you trust in me and cling to me, then you are not a slave. You are a son or a daughter. And if you remain in union with me, rest assured, you will be with me forever. Powerful. Hallelujah. But that's New Testament. Well, what about Old Testament? They'll say, well, okay, well, the Quran agrees with the Old Testament. Well, let's see. Remember, Muhammad told the Jews, you are not the sons of Allah. Okay, well, let's go to Exodus 4, 22 and 23. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn son. So wait. Israel is God's firstborn son, the first nation that he formed to be his son on earth? Yes. But Allah said, no, the Jews are not my children. I have no children. I'm not a spiritual father. So the Quran even contradicts the Old Testament. Yeah. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1. You are the children of the Lord your God. To not cut yourself or shave the You are the children of what? Your Lord, your God. But Allah says, the Israelites are not my children. Yeah. But here we're told by God through Moses, you Israelites are the children of the Lord, Yahuwah, your God, and do, therefore do not cut yourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let me show you some of the problems with the commands of the Quran and how they contradict the commands of God given to Moses and the commands given through the Lord Jesus, our, our Savior, right? Yeah. I want you to go to chapter 2 of the Quran, 230. So if a husband divorces his wife three times, then it is not lawful for him to remarry her until after she was married another man and then he's divorced. Then it is permissible for them to reunite as long as they feel they are able to maintain the limits of Allah. These okay. are the limits set by Allah, which he makes clear for people of knowledge. Okay, let me explain why this is important, because it shows you the God of Muhammad is not the God revealed in Moses. Here it's talking about irrevocable divorce, meaning when you've divorced mm -hmm. completely. Because in Islam, you have to tell a woman you're going to divorce her three times. So I can't just say, I divorce you. I have to say it three times. Now, some will allow it at the same moment. I can say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Talak, 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 and it's over. Others say, no, you got to do it in separate times. Oh. So if I say, I divorce you today, that doesn't count. But if I could tomorrow and I say, I divorce you, I got to do it a third time on another day. So for three different days, I told you I divorce you, then it's over. You can't touch me. I can't touch you. So what does the Quran say? If that happens and I want to take you back, let's say you're my wife, you got to first marry someone else. And Muhammad said that someone else must taste your sweetness, your honey, have sex with you and divorce you. And only then I can take you back. 
Okay. You understand this rule? Yes, understood. So imagine your husband got upset and he divorced you and he regrets it. You can't go back. You got to go marry someone. He has to have sex with you. And if he divorces you, then he can take you back. Mm -hmm. The guy that makes you lawful for your husband, he's called muhalal. He makes you halal, halala. Yeah. Do you want to, is it sinking in? I don't know if you're, you're happy it's, with this command in Islam or you think it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. That's what I'm waiting to hear that. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah. It's all right. Okay. <laughs> you see how disgusting it is? Yes, it's disgusting. Now let me show you how disgusting it is. You know what the God of Moses said about this command? Uh, he nope. said, if you were to do it, you are disgusting and abomination. Okay. God even said, before Muhammad, don't you ever do that. If you've divorced your wife and she marries someone else and he divorces and dies, you cannot take her back. It's disgusting. That's what the true God says. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 24, 4 verses 1 of 4. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her certificate of divorce, give it, gives it to her and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his, ha his house, she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if, she, or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That will be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Wow. How can then Allah of the Quran be the God revealed through Moses <laughs> when God said, if your wife is divorced, she married a second time, you better not take her back because then you're going to defile the land. And this is the disgusting. But Allah says, the only way you can take back your wife is she's had sex with another man and he divorced her. Yeah, it's literally the opposite that God said. You see? How can it be the same God? Yeah, it's not. Let me give you another example. Now, you're going to read Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 of 4. Let me show you how beautiful the God of Moses is, who's the God revealed in Jesus, because the Bible is God's true word. And I'll show you how disgusting Allah is. Go to Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 of 14. Read. When you go to war against your enemies in the Lord your God delivers them into your hands and you take captives if you if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her you may take her as your wife bring her into your home and have her shave her head trim her nails and put aside the clothes she has wearing when captured captured after she has lived in your house and mourned her father and mother for a full month then you may go to her and her and be her husband and she shall be your wife if you are not pleased with her let her go wherever she wishes you must not sell her or treat her as a slave since you have dishonored her wow you uh, see this was written 20 20 years before muhammad in a culture where women were considered property and whose lives and livelihood were threatened. Look what the God of Moses said. When you go to battle, because you're going to go to battle, it's inevitable. You're going to see a woman that's beautiful. Number one, she can't be married. Mm -hmm. Number two, you can't have sex with her. You got to marry her and make her your wife, but you can't make your wife immediately. You got to give her a whole month to mourn the loss of her parents. But on top of that, during that month, you change your clothes. You don't have her remain in the clothes of captivity when you captured her try to erase that thought from her you give her a whole month and she's got to shave her head to mourn that was a sign of mourning then after a month you can marry her make your wife but if you divorce her she's free to go wherever she wants you cannot sell her as a slave no. you see how beautiful the god of moses is because he's the god revealed in jesus right yes in an ancient culture that did not value women understand why this is amazing because in giving your month after shaving your head, this will then check the person's heart. Because if it's lust, when you see a bald woman, you're not going to be attracted to her. So this is also a way of ensuring that he loves her and he's not lusting for her because he wants to have sex with her. Mm. Right? Yeah. The last thing I want is to marry a bald woman. Because if I see a bald woman, it's gonna, it looks like two bald dudes. I'm bald, <laughs> you're bald, ain't going to happen, right? <laughs> and I'm not going to be wearing no wig for you. You get my point? Yes, yes, I understand. You see how God is ensuring, wait, it's not lust. You want to really marry her. 
Mm. And you better give her the status of a wife. That means you're going to treat her as a wife. And if you divorce her like any other Israelite woman, you set her free. But now let me show you the God of Muhammad. 2,200 years later, chapter 4, verse 24. Muhammad comes 2,200 years later. Look at the difference between the God who gave the law to Moses 2,200 years earlier with Allah. Also forbidden, prohibited to you to have sex with women already married, except those whom your right hands possess. Did you remember this? Yes, I remember. So according to Allah, you can only have sex with a married woman if she's a captive. Then you can have sex with her, meaning rape her, even if her husband is alive. You don't have to marry her, and then you can sell her off. Wow, disgusting. How can it be the same God? Yeah, horrible, disgusting. I can give you a lot more examples, but you see the point, right? Yes, yes. We can go on and on with how the God revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the law given to Moses, shows that Allah the Quran is a false God. He's Satan who inspired Muhammad to supplant the true God and his true prophets and apostles. Do you have any other questions? Because I can give you a lot more, but this should suffice, correct? Yes. So this came because I was watching a, a debate uh, between a Christian and a Muslim. And this okay. Muslim was was saying, oh, no, we never claimed Allah is Yahweh from the Bible. They are lying because it says Allah is the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, the God who sent Jesus, the God of the prophets. What the hell are they talking about? Yeah, I got confused because of that. So that's why I was wondering. Here, let me prove to you that the Quran says that your God and their God is one and the same. Go to chapter 29, verse 46 of the Quran. Do not argue with the people of the book unless gracefully except with those of them who act wrongfully and say we believe in what has been revealed to us and what was revealed to you. Our God and your God is only one and to him we fully submit. So where do they get that their God is not supposed to be the God of the Bible? I agree with them. The God of the Quran is not the God of the Bible. <laughs> Yes. But that's not what the Quran tells him to say, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there, yeah. So I don't know. That I don't know why he would say that, but I hope that helped. He's right. All of the Quran is not Yahweh of the Bible, but that's not what the Quran says. The Quran says that it's Allah who gave the Torah, gave Moses a book, sent Jesus with the gospel. Well, if I go with the Torah and the gospel, then that's Yahweh, and the one who sent Jesus is the Father. So I don't know what they're talking about, but no. He's not the same God, though they're supposed to believe it's the same God.